Hi, good evening, and um, welcome to Rushing McCall's Estate Planning Basics. My name is John Rushing. Uh, my uh, partner and colleague, Ryan McCall, is with us this evening, and uh, we are excited to have everyone here. We're still just admitting a few people from the waiting room, and uh, we'll get started here in, in just a few seconds. Um, just by way of housekeeping, you may have some questions tonight. We are super happy to answer your questions, and uh, if you feel free to put them in the chat, that would make it uh, easy on us to keep up with the different questions from different folks, and we'll be sure to try to get to all the questions at the end. Okay, well, let's jump in. So um, again, welcome to Estate Planning Basics. I am John Rushing, Ryan McCarl is with me, and tonight we're gonna cover a few different topics about basic estate planning here in the state of California. And um, first, just to give you a sense of uh, who we are, uh, Rush McCarl is a full service law firm in the heart of Silicon Beach. We service the needs of growing businesses and individuals. And if we can be of help to you, we certainly would like to be. But uh, tonight is really not about the law firm. It's really about helping educate you about some of the basics of estate planning. And so um, before we jump in, I just want to give you the sort of a needed disclaimer, which is today is April 7th, 2021, and the law changes. Uh, so if you're watching this video on YouTube, uh, and it's after this date, the law may have changed and you wanna reach out to an attorney to make sure that your estate plan is compliant with the law. Um, also, uh, we are licensed here in the state of California. Uh, I'm licensed in Texas and Illinois. My uh, partner, Brian, is licensed in DC, but uh, this presentation is set up for California residents. So if you're not from California, if you're from another state, you wanna reach out to an attorney in your state that can help you because state law varies from state to state. Uh, that said, let's jump in. Um, tonight, we're going to cover a few things. And at the outset, I think it's worth uh, saying a couple of words about estate planning. Uh, these can be difficult topics sometimes for people to uh, engage with. It certainly isn't pleasant to think about death or taxes. And tonight, we're going to talk about both. Um, the truth is this. Uh, when your time comes, uh, the fact is that your, your loved ones are going to be uh, dealing with quite a lot. And there is an act of care in thinking through and taking care of some of the loose ends uh, that they might otherwise have to. And that's really what estate planning is about. Uh, I'm a father of a 13 year old, God forbid anything happened to myself or my wife. Um, but if something did happen to me, I would want my wife to be able to um, deal with that uh, in the, the best way possible and not have to worry about getting my financial life straight. Uh, so try to take care of that now while I have the chance. Uh, so we're going to talk about a few little things. We've got eight topics basically tonight. Uh, the first is simple. It's what is an estate plan and why do you need one? Uh, we're going to then go on to talk a little bit about probate. You know, a lot of folks have heard of probate, but they don't necessarily know what it is, what probate assets are. So we're going to try to give you a little insight onto that. We're going to talk about the type of property that you have. And how is that property held? Because property can be held in different ways. And the way that title is held may change uh, how that property should be disposed of or the way that your estate plan may want to treat it. We want to talk about incapacity and final care planning. Obviously, these are uh, not things that are pleasant to think about, but uh, it is inevitable that um, we all reach the end of the road sometime. And uh, as someone who has seen the difficulty and the stress uh, that families encounter when these decisions haven't been at least discussed and thought about, I can tell you, you can avoid a lot of grief and a lot of heartache for your family if you think about them early on. So we're gonna to touch on that subject. We're also gonna talk about guardianship and minor children. Um, you know, it's surprising to a lot of people that uh, children can't inherit, but it's just one of the um, little quirks of the law. And so you need to have a guardian uh, to take care of your child's assets until such time that they can take them legally. Um, we'll talk about some of the things you might want to think about uh, when appointing a guardian, and we'll talk about the sort of process that you may go through. We're going to talk about wills and trusts. You know, everyone has probably heard of a will. It's stuff that's sort of out there, and, and people know that uh, grandma has a will, or maybe your cousin or or someone else that you know has had a will, but we're gonna talk a little more specifically about what wills are good for, who uh, may want to have a will, and uh, some of the pros and cons of a will. And then we're gonna shift gears. 
we're going to talk about trusts and really get kind of demystify uh, what a living trust is and how it might become an important part of your estate plan. And then finally, we're going to talk about taxes. It's inevitable. We'll touch on it just a little bit because it does have a part to do in estate planning and minimizing taxes. And uh, we're going to kind of round the bases and finish up on that tax subject. And then, of course, we'll take your questions. So without uh, any further ado, let's jump in. Why have an estate plan? Well, for me, it really comes down to two things. The first is you've probably worked pretty hard to get what you have. And you want to make sure that it goes to the people and the institutions that you care about. And you really can't do that unless you have an estate plan. The second thing is it's just practical. You want to make things easier on your loved ones. You know, it's just a, it's a stressful and difficult time when someone that you love passes. And if these sorts of problems can be dealt with early on, it just makes it easier on your loved ones. So out of respect to them, I think you should settle your affairs uh, so that they don't have to deal with the stress of untangling what might otherwise be a pretty complicated financial life while they're, of course, in a moment of grief. So those are two really good reasons to have an estate plan, but I think there's also a third, and it's one that we didn't list here, and it's just the peace of mind of knowing when you go to bed at night, if something happened, that you've got everything in place. And I think that means a lot. We've all learned during this pandemic about the fragility of life and the value of home and the value of family and that we may not have tomorrow promised to us. And so I do think that peace of mind is an important thing and it's something that uh, an attorney can help you figure out. So these are good reasons to have an estate plan. What is an estate plan? Well, look, it's actually not that complicated. At the core, what an estate plan is, is a set of instructions. And it's a set of instructions about how you're gonna distribute your property when you do die. And estate plans consist of a bunch of different documents. They often include um, preparations for lifetime gifts. Uh, they, they have instructions for incapacity. We spoke briefly about guardianship of minor children. Uh, there may be HIPAA authorizations, other documents in a collection of documents that is the estate plan. And what that is, it's, it's really like the go-to manual about how you want to have things done. So if that's what an estate plan is, then, well, it's all about choice. And the good news is it's your choice. You get to determine the goals. And I think a lot of people are surprised to find out that estate plans aren't cookie cutter. You know, there are a lot of places on the internet you can download a will or download a trust and fill in the form yourself. But the fact is, who gets what? How tax efficient do you want to be? Does it comply with the law of your state or your financial life and the way that you're going to juggle that financial life and pull that spaghetti apart and where all that goes? And, and all of that, it's really going to be determined by your goals and your choices. Let me give you a couple of examples. You can incentivize certain behavior, certain actions. Would you like your heir to go to a particular school or spend money on uh, a particular type of education or have money for medical expenses? That's something that, that you can do. Um, you know, parents often have a house and uh, they want to have their kids come back to the house. Uh, it's not uncommon to try to keep the family together. I actually think it's a wonderful thing if there is a, a family house, a vacation home where the kids can come back together once a year. And that's something that can be done in an estate plan. So my point here isn't that you should do it this way or that you shouldn't do it another way. My point is it's you who gets to decide. It's your choice. And because it's your choice, it'll be helpful for you to sit down with an attorney that has been down this road a few times and can help you figure out how to meet your goals. So if it's about choices and it's about goals, then I think you're beginning to get the picture. And this is a comprehensive plan that you should be putting together. So what does that mean? Well, it means different things for different estates. You know, some states are modest, some states are large, some states are kind of in between, some states are small. And there are different mechanisms for achieving your goals that'll be right, depending on the type of estate you have. Here are a few things that a comprehensive estate plan 
will probably have in it. First, there's going to be a will. It's going to be either a pour over will if there is an accompanying trust or a uh, simple will. Um, if there is a pour over will, then of course, you're going to have a trust. And a trust is essentially a mechanism for distributing property and moving it out of probate. We're going to talk about that a little later. The plan is also going to have what lawyers like to call durable powers of attorney for asset management and health care. And basically, a power of attorney is a, a document that gives someone the right to make decisions for you if you're incapacitated so that you don't have to go to court and have someone argue about what should be done and have a judge make the decision. There are going to be advanced directives. It's one of those things that it's important to think about. Do you want to be resuscitated? Don't you? Are you an organ donor? These are important and easy things for you to make decisions about now so that your loved ones don't have to struggle with it later. Finally, there's going to be some HIPAA uh, privacy waiver that's going to be put into place so that your loved ones can get the medical information that they need if you are incapacitated. There are a few other smaller elements, depending on the complexity of your estate, that your plan may or may not have. But what I want you to understand tonight is that when we talk about an estate plan, it's not just one document. It's a collection of documents. It's a set of instructions that you give to your loved ones to help them when the time for the transition comes. And an attorney can advise you about how to do this best. We'll talk a little bit later about this, but part of a comprehensive estate plan is going to be about taxes and about how you might draw down your estate or how you might distribute your estate through lifetime gifts, making guardianship arrangements for children, talking about naming beneficiaries and retirement account and insurance policies. These are all some of the things that we'll be discussing and some of the things that you'll be thinking about. Now, Hopefully at this point, you're probably thinking, well, golly, I probably need an estate plan, but what if I don't have one? Well, relax a little bit. The good news is if you don't have an estate plan, uh, the law does actually have a safety net for you. It's called the law of intestacy. That's the good news. Um, if you die without a will or you die without uh, some mechanism for distributing your estate, the law is going to step in and, and it's going to determine who gets what. Now. Here's the downside. If you don't make those determinations, your estate may go to people that you may or may not want to have your stuff. And it may, be, may not be distributed in the way that you would find ideal. Also, intestacy can be slow, can uh, take time, and it can incur all sorts of fees that you might otherwise avoid or, or minimize. So if you don't have an estate plan, the law does provide a framework, but I think you'll find out there's really no reason not to have a plan going forward. So before we move into this, I just want to talk about some of these sort of misconceptions that Ryan and I see from time to time. People say, well, hey, you know what? I'm not wealthy. I mean, come on. I, I can't afford an estate plan. I, I don't really need one. It's really just for rich guys. And I think this is a real problem. And it's something that folks just don't seem to always understand, which is estate plans or for everyone, they're not just for the wealthy. In fact, if you have a modest estate, if you're middle class, you, you could argue that maybe you need an estate plan even more than the wealthy. And that is because you have less to lose and you wanna make sure that it is uh, treated efficiently and it goes to the people that you love and that you care about. Here's the thing, probate and other fees, they, they can eat up an estate and this is something that we can help you with, which is saving money by being prepared at the outset. So that leads us to this question. What are my assets? If estate plans are for everyone and there's an estate plan to kind of fit all sizes, and um, then the question is, what size do you need? And this is the first step on the road to getting your estate plan, which is figuring out what is it that you have? And an, an estate planning attorney will help you with this. There's a thing we give our clients, it's called an asset inventory form. It helps you get organized, it helps you understand what you have. And the truth is you may have more than you realize when you start talking about retirement accounts and real estate, life insurance policies, it adds up pretty quickly. And so you wanna get your arms around what that estate is. 
And I'm going to shift gears a little bit now and talk about probate. And the reason I am is because when we talk about understanding what assets you have, attorneys are putting them into categories. And that category is probate or non-probate. There are other categories we'll talk about a little bit later. But let's start with probate. What is probate? It's a judicial process by which a court supervises the distribution of property after someone's death. That's nothing wrong with that. It's a good thing. It's something that our law has provided to make sure that there are no shenanigans so that there is a, a judge to look at it and say, yeah, this is exactly what this person wanted. And we're going to make sure it happens like that. Because, you know, when someone is gone and it's just a piece of paper that says, this is what I want, that person can't come in and testify. And so it becomes really a process where sometimes people want to um, try to squeeze a little more out of the estate, try to get something that maybe they weren't due. And unfortunately, sometimes fraud does happen. So the law has stepped in and they said, look, we're going to create probate courts. And we're going to make sure there is no fraud. And that's a good thing. But here's the other side of that. Probate proceedings are a public record. That means that if your property is in probate, that anyone can look up and see what you've got. And it's slow moving. And the probate court imposes fees, and it's based on a percentage of the estate's value. So when we talk about what is probate, what estate planning attorneys are doing is they're saying, how many of your assets are going to end up in probate? Because not all assets are probate assets. So the question is, how do you keep your assets out of probate? Well, let's talk about what probate assets are and what non-probate assets are. A probate asset is something that passes through the will or passes through a probate court's jurisdiction. Non-probate assets, I want you to think of the classic non-probate asset as a payable on death bank account. Why is it not a probate asset? Here's why. Johnny has a bank account. It says it's gonna pay Susie on the death of Johnny. Johnny dies. As soon as Johnny dies, that bank pays Susie. The money never went into Johnny's estate. The money went directly to Susie. It was her money as soon as Johnny died. That's an asset that isn't in the jurisdiction of the probate court. There are all sorts of assets that may fall into that category. So remember earlier when I talked about your asset inventory and understanding what you own, how title is held? This is why I'm talking about that because it's important for you to understand whether you're dealing with a probate asset or a non-probate asset. Now, that raises a really interesting question, which is how is your property held? Now, we're gonna talk a little bit later about all sorts of ways of titling property and holding property. And I'm not gonna get in the weeds with you about the uh, sort of arcane ways that a house might be held or a condo might be owned. But I want to start right now and talk about community property and jointly held property. So when we start talking about assets and property, if you're married or um, you have a civil union, uh, chances are if you don't have a prenuptial agreement that your spouse owns pretty much half of whatever it is that you earn during the marriage. That's called community property and California is a community property state. Now, if you're finding this on YouTube or you're seeing this somewhere else and you're in a diff different state, you need to contact an attorney in that state because not all states are community property states and the law will treat these things differently. But in California, you may not own quite what you think you own. So without a prenuptial agreement, you have a paycheck from your boss. Chances are 50 percent of that is owned by your spouse. Not a bad thing. It just means that your estate can only give away what you actually own. And if some of your property is community property, you only own half of that. I also want to talk about property that might be jointly held with the right of survivorship. There are a lot of different ways of holding real estate uh, in the state of California and, and in every state. Um, one way of doing that is joint tenancy with a right of survivorship. And what that means is that you have 
two or more people that are joint tenants in the estate. They own this piece of property and they own it right down the middle. But guess what? Soon as one of them dies, the full title of that property transfers to the surviving owner. And that's what I talk about when I talk about jointly held property with a right of survivorship. It means that the property automatically transfers to the survivor on the other's death. And property that transfers this way cannot be transferred in will. It's because it, there's nothing to transfer. It's already gone. Now, we're going to put a pin in this. Uh, it may come up in your questions. And if you decide that you do want an estate plan, it's something that your attorney will look at. But there are a lot of other ways of owning and holding property. You may not own it with a right of survivorship. And it may very well be that you have property in the estate that can be transferred in a will. And that's one of the things that your attorney and you are going to try to sort through and figure out and understand how you want to um, dispose of that property. We're going to shift gears a little bit here. And um, we'll talk a little bit about incapacity and final care planning. We've talked a lot up until now about the property that you own, the way you hold it. Is it probate? Is it not probate? But one of the things that we do have to face is that the end comes for all of us. And a comprehensive estate plan should include some sort of incapacity and final care planning. Now, this is important. You know, it's not that um, anyone's kids or loved ones um, are cantankerous or, or difficult. It's that when they're under stress, uh, they're trying to make the best decision they can for you and reasonable minds can differ. And so as someone that's seen this go the other way, let me tell you, if you become incapacitated, you want someone empowered to make medical and financial decisions for you. It's essential that someone has that authority so that your children and your, your loved ones don't end up arguing about this and being in a gridlock. It's important because when things go really bad, sometimes you got to get the court involved and that's no good for anyone. An estate planning attorney can help you think about these difficult decisions and how you might want to manage them. They include things like DNRs. They include things like being an organ donor. They can talk about upfront what happens if uh, doctors believe that you have uh, no ability to recover. How long do you want to be allowed to uh, be sustained. And while it's unpleasant, it is uh, unfortunately part of life. And it's a way of showing care to those that you love. It's something to think about. It's something that a good attorney can help you think through. On a happier note, minor children. You know, if you have kids, you really do need to appoint a guardian. And you need to do it for at least two reasons. One is your children need to have a caretaker. And that person should have your values. That person should be someone that, well, you trust with your children's life. I do this for a good buddy of mine. I'm, I'm one of his appointed guardians for his children. And you should probably have a backup guardian just in case something happens to your first choice uh, or they're unable to perform their duties. There's someone else that you believe in, that you know will raise your children the way that you want them to be raised with values that you believe in. Now, that's a really important thing to think about. And of course, the standard that courts use is best interest of the child. And if you haven't appointed a guardian, the court will appoint one for you. But court is gonna take your opinion as a parent really seriously. And you can avoid a lot of heartache by doing that now. The second is, and this is sort of a practical and surprising to some people, uh, law point of view, kids can't inherit property. I know it's shocking. I mean, my, my niece, I gave her a birthday gift. What do you mean she can't have property? She got the Barbie Playhouse or whatever it was that we gave her a couple of years ago. What I mean is this, when you start talking about substantial gifts, you're talking about inheriting uh, money or you're talking about inheriting property. Uh, you're talking about inheriting personal items of value. Uh, children cannot do that. 
there has to be a guardian appointed for them in order to hold and administer and manage that property until they reach legal age. And again, if you don't point someone, court will do it for you. Look, the last thing I'm going to say on this is those don't always have to be the same person. Often they are, but you know, I know people that would be wonderful financial planners for my son were something to happen to me. They might not be the best person to raise my son. Um, so you've got some bandwidth here. You've got a few things to think about. And this is one of the reasons why when you know lawyers become members of the bar, they're called attorneys and counselors at law. This is what we help you think through. So consider your options and um, consider setting up a trust to hold the property for your kids, which is something we're going to be coming to pretty soon. All right. Before we shift gears entirely, though, and we start getting into the mechanisms for doing this, you know, just to review, we've talked uh, about why you might need an estate plan. We've talked about how you're in the driver's seat. We've talked about how you get to determine who gets what and why and some of the efficiencies and inefficiencies of doing that. We've talked about gifts to kids. We've talked about how property is held. We've talked about uh, end of life planning. And now we're going to pull it all together. We're going to talk about how you actually do it. So I said earlier that an estate plan is a, it's a group of documents. And I mentioned that it could include a will or a trust and a mechanism called a pour over will, which we'll get to. We're going to talk right now about traditional wills. This is what everyone knows. We know it from the movies. We know it from, you know, grandma who may have had a will. We know it because we've heard about it in culture all the time. The last will and testament. And what is a will? Well, a will is just a document that disposes of property um, when someone dies. It's called a testamentary document in law school, in big fancy words. And all it means is that it is a, a sworn document that testates to, it, it attests to what someone wants done with their property when they're gone, right? Leave it to a lawyer to make it overly complicated. Well, wills are administered by a probate court. We talked about that earlier. And it's important that a will is administered by a probate court because guess what? No one's there to testify that this is exactly what we wanted to have done. And that's why we have a judge look at it. Often wills make special bequests. So for example, I have a, a watch that I would really like to have go to my son. It's been in my family for a while and want to make sure he gets that. But there are also residual bequests it gives away the remaining property that someone may have. And you have an incredible amount of bandwidth with a will to dispose of property in all sorts of ways. And it can be a really creative and, and fun process. However, it is not a process to be a taken under lightly. It is a very specific document. Remember how we talked about earlier that sometimes people try to pull shenanigans uh, and that's why we have a probate court? Well, Every state has different requirements for what makes a valid will. It's one of the reasons why when people say, hey, I downloaded this will, uh, is it valid? I always sort of swallow and, you know, take a look at the document and think long and hard because the way a will is executed matters and it changes from state to state. Some states rec rec recognize what are called holographic wills, wills written all out by hand. Others don't. And you need to speak to an attorney to figure out what state you're in and whether your will is valid. And more importantly than that, even if you have a valid will, if it's not executed correctly, it's not going to be enforceable. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is there are witnesses to a will. So here's a question. COVID-19 comes along. Suddenly, we're all social distancing. How can a will actually be witnessed? Can it be witnessed online? Does that count? Do the witnesses need to be in the same room as the person writing their name on the will? Do both witnesses need to be there at the same time? Or can one witness be waiting outside while witness A wit you know, witnesses the writing and signs, and then witness B comes in and takes a look at it and signs? Does that count? Can someone sign their name on the will and then walk up to the witness and go, yeah, this is my name. I signed it. I want you to witness that. Does that count? Let me tell you, it sounds silly, but these are really important questions. These are questions that litigators have made a lot of money from. 
because wills get challenged all the time. So I encourage you, if you decide that a will is right for you, that you make sure you talk to an attorney and you get it executed in the right way. It's not anything to take lightly. But that raises a question. So what are the pros and cons of a traditional will? Because like everything, life is about choices. There's always going to be a pro and a con to any choice. There's going to be a trade-off. Here's the thing. If you have a, a smaller estate, a will might very well be a good thing for you. Depends on what you value. Remember, we talked earlier about choices and what you value and how you're in the driver's seat. Yeah, you have a smaller estate. You're going to have probate costs. It's going to be associated with the will, but it might actually be a good thing for you. That's something you need to determine with your, with your attorney. But here are what I think of as the pros and cons of a traditional will. Properly drafted and executed will, it's relatively simple. It's relatively inexpensive. It's a good way to express your wishes and distribute property. That's great. What's the con? Well, one, if you don't do it right, it's not gonna be enforceable. Two, poorly drafted wills can create ambiguity that ends up costing you all sorts of money when it gets fought over in court. And three, Property has to go through probate. And we talked about how that's expensive, but not only is it expensive, it's public record. Now, every family's different, and maybe mine is unique. I don't know. But, you know, I've got some uh, nosy folks in my family. Don't know that I would want them all to know what I own and how I'm giving it away. I'm just kind of a private guy that way. If that's you, you probably want to think twice before having a will. I don't like my stuff being out in the street. I like to keep that close. And you just can't do that when it's a public record. So pros and cons of a will, it's right for some people, right for estates of a certain size. If you don't care about privacy, no big deal. If the cost isn't a big deal to you and it's executed properly, it's gonna do just what you want. But there might be a better way to do this. How do we how do we minimize this? How do we get out of probate? How do we get out of that jurisdiction of the judge that we talked earlier about that makes this all a public record? The answer to that is the best way to minimize probate costs and expenses is to create a living trust. And we talked about it earlier. There are myths in the state planning and one is trusts are just for rich people, but they're not. Trust can be for anyone. If you've got property, and you want to make sure that it's given to the people that you love, and you want to make sure it's done in a tax efficient way, trust can be the right way to go. Well, we'll talk a little bit about that. What is a trust? At the risk of sounding uh, like maybe we're talking about history and it doesn't matter, and knowing that we've been going now for about half an hour, I'm going to tell you a little story about legal history, and, and maybe it'll wake you up. And uh, if you found this dry, maybe this is the juicy part. Trusts are some of the oldest things in Anglo-American law. They actually come from the Middle Ages, and uh, it's kind of surprising, but, you know, back in England in the Middle Ages, kings would give folks a bunch of land, and then they would tax them on the land. And those folks, of course, became the nobility and the lords and the knights and, you know, the ladies, you know, whatever the title discount or whatever they, they gave them. But the, the king would tax them based on the amount of land that they owned, right? Well, guess what? These guys figured out that if they could get the benefit of the land without actually owning it, then they wouldn't have to pay the taxes. And so what they did is they created a trust. They went to their local parish priest and they said, listen, Padre, I want you to have title to this land. I want you to hang on to it for me. When I ask for it back, you're going to give it back to me. But if the king asks who owns the land, you're going to be the person who owns it. And this was really good for him because, of course, the church didn't pay any taxes. And that's how the trust was created. So what is a living trust? It's exactly that. It's a, it's a mechanism for shifting legal ownership of assets into a trust and under the control of the trustee while maintaining the beneficial ownership of the assets for the beneficiary. I kind of love it. Well, here's the good news. Trusts, living trusts, can be revocable. They're created by you in life. You can revoke them at any time. You just have to dot the I's and cross the T's and they're gone. All the stuff is right back in your pocket. When you die, of course, they become irrevocable. Now, why would you do this? 
You do this because if you create a living trust and you move your assets into the trust, and that's a pretty important thing to do. Once the trust is created, you got to put the property in it. It's no longer probate. It's a non-probate asset. That's why you do it. Now, before we move on and we get too uh, deep into this, I do want to just point out there are all sorts of trusts. There are irrevocable trusts. That might be right for someone of uh, a pretty sizable estate that needs to shift assets into uh, a, a place that they don't actually own them and do that for tax reasons. There are real estate trusts. There are all sorts of ways of uh, creating legal structures that may benefit you if you have a complex estate. And that's really not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a living trust uh, that's right for most people uh, that have some property that they want to move out of probate. If you have questions about specific, uh, more detailed uh, estate planning, feel free to reach out to us. And of course, we'll be happy to talk to you. Moving on. Benefits of the trust. Well, you put all the assets into the revocable living trust, you get to retain control over them during life, probably because you're the trustee as well as the beneficiary. But when you die, as I mentioned, they're no longer probate assets. And this allows you to retain the financial privacy that you value, maximize the flexibility that most people value in terms of moving assets and giving assets to different people and minimizing probate fees. And trust can also help you minimize estate taxes, which we're going to talk about here shortly. So that's sort of the big picture. We talked about wills, which is a way that's good for a lot of people of disposing of assets. They go through probate. They have to be executed in a very specific way. We talked about how we might want to move assets out of a probate status and into a trust. And of course, you can have all sorts of beneficiaries in the trust. You can do it in a living trust. And when you die, of course, the trust becomes permanent. All right, let's talk about taxes. It's always the question, right? What about taxes? Taxes is, is a reality of life. And um, unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do about it. Now, if uh, you're watching today, uh, April 7th, you may have seen the cover of the New York Times all about a new corporate tax plan that the uh, new administration is proposing. And I highlight that not because it is relevant to estate planning, but only to say that taxes can change. Congress acts all the time and changes and you know, changes the mechanisms, monkeys with the tax code. And that may be something that happens in the future. So if you're watching this video at another time, be sure to consult with an estate planning attorney. Make sure that you're up to date because, you know, laws change. Let's talk a little bit about estate taxes. Here's the deal. Right now in America, if your estate is $11.7 million and you die today, you're not going to have to pay estate taxes. You'd say, wow, $11.7 million, that's a lot of money. Yeah, you're right. It is a lot of money. And in 2025, that exemption is scheduled to go down to $5 million. And there's talk right now about moving that exemption even lower sooner, somewhere in the $3 million range. We'll see what happens with the new administration. That may or may not happen. Now, the good news is 11.7 million right now is a lot of money and God forbid you don't want to die in order to avoid taxes. If your spouse passes away uh, or if you do your estate planning right, you may be able to actually double that with what's called a spousal election. Um, so you may, instead of dealing with 11 million and change, maybe dealing with 22 million and change. I'm not going to get into the weeds of that and how we do the number crunching. That's really a discussion for you and your estate planning attorney, and it's an important discussion if you have an estate of a sizable amount. Now, I know it sounds like a huge amount of money, especially even with the reset at $5 million. I mean, $5 million is it's real money. If you live in the state of California, though, you know pretty quickly that if you own property, you can be pretty surprised at how that property goes up in value. So again, earlier today, we talked about getting your assets together that asset inventory form. Something you're gonna to wanna to think about when you put your asset inventory form together is what property you own, what the value of that property is and how much you bought it for and so on and so forth. But there's good news. What is it? The law allows you a way to draw down that money and the estate planners can help you do that. They can help you figure out a way to do it. I'm gonna shift gears a little bit now. We're gonna talk about the gift tax exemption. 
So, you know, the only, only sure thing in life is death and taxes, right? Well, what happens if, you know, Uncle Joe wakes up and let's say that Uncle Joe is a multimillionaire and he decides to give the, his niece Susie a million dollars. And Susie gets the money and goes, holy smokes, Uncle Joe, you're the greatest thing ever. That's great. I love it. And Susie goes, it was a gift. It's a gift. You know, it, it, I, you know I, I shouldn't have to pay taxes on it. It's a gift. Well, guess what? Uncle Joe is going to have to pay taxes on that. That's called the gift tax. And you know, Uncle Sam is pretty smart. He can figure out how to reach into your pocket. But even as smart as Uncle Sam is, he still has a little bit of a heart. And he gives you a way to give gifts without having to pay a gift tax. You can give $15,000 of gifts to a person in a tax year. And it's tax free, it's, it's free of the gift tax. And this is an effective mechanism if you have a sizable estate for helping reduce the amount of that estate in a planned way. So that if you're concerned about paying the estate tax, the death tax, uh, that hopefully with careful planning, you've reduced the value of that estate. So it's just a few little things about taxes. Again, something to talk about with your estate planning attorney, something not to underestimate and something to make sure that you're up to speed on when the time comes to make your estate plan because the law does change. So we've covered a lot of ground tonight. We've, we've talked about you know everything from what an estate plan is to things you may value to how to figure out what you own and probate assets and wills and trusts and oh my God, my head is gonna explode. We talked about taxes. Here's the deal, it is complicated, but if you have the right guide, it doesn't have to be overwhelming. And there are a lot of great estate planning attorneys out there that can help you out. And of course, we would like to be one of them. If we can help you, we're certainly here to do so. I'll shift gears now. And uh, I know that my colleague has uh, been looking at questions that we might have in the chat and I'll give you time to think about some of the things we discussed. If you have questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. And um, it's just good to be able to visit with you and hopefully be of service. So thank you so much for your time. And we'll open the floor to questions. Thank you, John. That, that was very enlightening. Um, once again, if you have any questions, if you could just put them in, put them in, a, in the chat, I'll see them uh, and you can read them for, for John. Uh, we did get a couple of questions, um, in particular about putting a house in, in a trust. Uh, you know, what, what are the reasons for it? Is it just to make things easier for loved ones when you depart? Are, are there other reasons uh, and are there any disadvantages? And I'll, I can take the first stab at that. And then John, if you want to add anything, um, you know, it, it certainly does make things easier for, for your loved ones when you depart because it doesn't have to go through probate. Uh, it also doesn't have to pay those probate fees. So usually for, for you know, most average people, uh, the, the home they own, if they do own a home, is their most sizable asset. So when you start talking about maybe probate fees of 3% uh, of that asset, you know, you're talking real money. And, um, you know, it's just a very sensible way to avoid that is to uh, have, make it so that a trustee owns the house and you don't own it. Therefore, when you die, uh, it doesn't even go into the, pro the estate. Uh, the, the trustee owns it uh, for your own benefit, uh, for your life. And then once you pass, it's for the benefit of, it's then held for the benefit of your named beneficiaries, uh, which is kind of analogous to who you would name in a will as the people to retain it uh, or to receive it. Uh, the only disadvantage is a slight amount of complexity and, and setup costs. Uh, I don't, I, I don't advise people to really try to set up trust themselves. I think that's one where you definitely want to contact an attorney. So there's a little bit of an upfront cost there, a um, little bit of additional complexity. Uh, you have to change the deed, you know, the, who, who owns the deed, you know, the, the name on it is going to be, you know, such and such person as trustee of the McCarl family trust or whatever it may be. Um, but really, those are really minor, uh, in my view, minor uh, drawbacks, um, you know, compared to the benefits, which are sizable. John, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think you I think you did really great and uh, cover those bases. I the only thing I would add is it's a little bit speculative, but just to kind of bring uh, anyone that's listening into the uh, current conversation, you know, there is a suggestion right now uh, that perhaps the Biden administration will change what's called the stepped up basis rule, which is about how assets are valued uh, when someone dies. So for example, if, uh, you know, grandma paid $100 for a house and she died and the house was worth $500, 
uh, then the question is, how is that house valued? Uh, it, does the kid take the house with the basis of $100 and pay the tax on um, the inside gain, which would be $400, or does the kid take the house with the basis of five? Right now, it is being seriously debated about whether there will be an adjustment in what's called the stepped up basis rule. If that happens, it's going to have profound effects on um, the tax code and on planning. Uh, for uh, shifting these these assets to the end of life. I think that uh, if you own property in the state of California, you should very seriously consider a trust. There are a lot of good reasons to do it. As Ryan said, there are some upfront costs, but on the whole, I, I personally think it's a pretty good idea. Yeah, John, was, uh, another question is, uh, can, you make, can you give any advice uh, for people that are looking to give money to charity? Yes, I think it's a wonderful question. I'm so glad you brought it up. Um, I didn't say enough about it, and it is a really important part of estate planning. I mean, look, here's the thing. We, we get one shot to um, make a difference in this world, and uh, I think most of us do our level best to do it, and we make a difference with our, our family and our kids and our friends and our community. And there are things that I personally deeply value that I want to help support uh, when I'm gone. And... The thing is, I want to make sure, though, that when I support those um, those charities, uh, that they remain the charities that I intended to support. So in other words, I don't want to support a charity, for example, that might I'm going to make it up now. But let's say that I want to support a charity that uh, is, you know, about cleaning up the ocean and about saving the lives of uh, baby you know, animals that might, you know, might be in polluted water. Uh, let, let's say that I value that and I want to support it. I think it's a great thing to do. And I think that you should be doing that in your trust or in your will. Um, it's great to have that kind of civic heart. What happens, though, if the charity takes the money and spends it on something else? What happens if the charity ceases to exist? How is it that we can make sure that that gift, that gift is adequately used and goes to something that you care about? And, and those are some of the things that uh, state planning attorneys can can help you with. And and yes, uh, I think charitable donations are super important and it should be part of the discussion that you have with your lawyer. Great. Thank you, John. Um, uh, another question we have is, uh, if you put property into a trust, is that a taxable event? Uh, and I can take a first step at that one too. And the answer in short is no. Um, you know, if it's a revocable living trust, uh, then, um, you know, the you have full access to it you can take it out of the trust at any time. So therefore the IRS considers putting your own property into a replicable living trust as being a non-event. It's just like moving it from one bank account to another. It's not really how it is legally, uh, but that is how the IRS uh, perceives it. Um, and uh, yeah, so you have, you have anything to add to that, John? Uh, I'd only add this, everything we've talked about tonight in terms of trust, it's all about uh, revocable uh, living trusts. And there are all sorts of trusts. There are real estate trusts. There are irrevocable trusts. There are ways that lawyers can monkey with and and try and uh, structure really complex estates in order to achieve some tax advantage. And that's really not what we're talking about. So if your question is, is it a taxable event? Um, any good lawyer is going to tell you we have to know all of the facts. Uh, and all we can tell you is if it is a revocable living trust and you're moving the, the house into that, it's not a taxable event. But if you had a more complex question, reach out to us and of course, we'll, we'll be helping, happy to help you. Right, absolutely. So with that, I think that's all of the questions, all the, all the questions that we have at the moment. Uh, however, if you have uh, other questions that you'd like to, uh, to, to bring to our attention, um, you know, pick up the phone or send us an email. You can see our contact information there on the screen. Um, you know, we're, and, you know, we'd love to hear from you. So uh, thank you all for attending. We appreciate your time. And uh, we, we plan to give more of these seminars. Uh, so, you know, um, please, please keep in touch. Thank you so much, Ryan. I thank everyone for attending. And uh, I'll just, I'll just close with this. And I'll say, you know, uh, being an adult, uh, whew, man, you know, sometimes you, you just wish you could be a kid and, and not have to deal with all these heavy adult things. But I think that uh, estate planning is a wonderful way to show your care and to help take care of your loved ones. And uh, one of the things that I really value, and I know Ryan values well, uh, as well about being an attorney, is the counseling role that we get to play uh, in helping clients find their way through achieving their goals. So 
Uh, I hope that you have had a little light shed on this process, got to think about your goals and ways you might achieve them. And whether it's us or another law firm, I encourage you to get your arms around this problem, uh, take the bull by the horns and put together an estate plan to take care of your loved ones. Thank you so much for, uh, for listening and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you all.